Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today we'll read from a book titled The Strongholds of India by Sidney Toy, published in 1957 by Heinemann. In the course of many years devoted to the study of ancient and medieval fortifications, the writer has been struck with the dearth of reliable literature on the forts of India. Despite the wealth of books with long descriptions and numerous illustrations of the temples, mosques, tombs and victory columns of that country, the attention given to fortifications is confined to a few meritorious monographs. There has been no comprehensive work devoted to the subject as a whole. Since no work on such a technical subject is of any value unless it is the result of personal investigation on the spot, the author spent the six months of winter 1955-1956 in the survey of a number of these fortifications, extending his operations from the foothills of the Himalayas in the north down to Madura in the south of India. Owing to the limited time at his disposal, examination of the numerous fortresses in Pakistan, many of which are of the greatest interest, had perforce to be deferred to a future visit. The medieval fortifications of India are practically innumerable. There are hundreds of them scattered about through that subcontinent, principally occupying the summits of high hills, often relatively close together, as in the hill ranges of Rajputana and the Deccan. Many of them are in a state of ruin, but a large number are so well preserved as to retain their medieval defenses practically intact. In these circumstances, it is obvious that the author's survey had to be restricted to the selection of typical and outstanding examples of these works, called not from one part of the country only, since that would give but a partial perception of the motives underlying their construction, but from the north and the south of India. It must be quite clear that this work is generally confined to the treatment of the fortifications in their military aspect. Practically all of them include magnificent and renowned temples, mosques, palaces and tombs, which have been described and illustrated at length elsewhere. It is because of the lack of information on the military architecture of India that this work has been undertaken. Nonetheless, the author has considered it desirable to include some cursory notes of outstanding examples of these structures, as well as to append short accounts of sieges and other episodes relating to the fortresses. All the fortresses included in this volume were examined by the author, who paid two or three visits to some of the most important of them. He has prepared all the drawings and taken all the photographs. The medieval fortifications of India occupy a position in the history of military architecture quite distinct from the sequence of development as observed in Europe, the Levant and indeed in China. It is clear that important factors in their design, quite apart from the question of defense, is that they should impress the observer, or the enemy, with their imposing and formidable aspect, as well as express the power and affluence of the ruler. The walls are of great thickness and height, strengthened at short intervals by massive towers, and the gateways, though not nearly so well defended as those in the west, are of no less imposing appearance than the walls. Another factor is the decorative ornament of the defenses, gateways covered with paneling and molded and sculptured ornament, constructive features such as arches, corbels and lintels carved in rich and elaborated designs, and even the merlons of the parapets cut in ornamental shapes. 
A striking feature of these fortifications is the tall and massive walls and towers designed in all essentials on medieval concepts were being built in India up to the middle of the 18th century, 200 years after such designs had been abandoned in the West, where forts designed on entirely different principles for defense by heavy guns were being built in all countries. Parapets were adapted for defense by musketry and by heavy guns. Tall pedestals were also built within the walls on which very heavy pieces were mounted. But it was not until the penetration of armies from the west into the country that forts suitable for defense against the growing force and destructive power of artillery were constructed. Military defenses are practically innumerable throughout India. Almost every hill in the range running northeast through the south of Rajputana has a fortification on its summit. The same may be said on the Deccan, with its numerous ranges of hills strewn with massive boulders piled one above another, and of the hilly districts of South India. Except where they stand on the banks of or near a river or occupy some kindred strategic site, they are perched on top of a precipitous hill from 600 feet to over 2500 feet above its foot. They were all built by the absolute ruler of the state in which they stand, well knowing that they were subject to attack at any moment by the monarch of an adjoining or far-off state, an event which was of frequent occurrence. These military works are also of great extent, their curtain walls forming circuits many miles round and when on hills uh, there are from two to four lines of such walls built at different levels and one within the other, the uppermost enclosing the citadel. Most of these extensive fortifications consist of a city and a citadel, the latter either within the city or on its flank, having one side towards the field where it is defended by a precipice or a river as at Delhi and Agra. Jinji occupies a special position since it covers three adjoining hills, all within an outer wall which runs round to enclose the three of them, the citadel being perched on the top of the middle and highest hill. Great attention was paid to the defense of the approach to a fortress. Generally, a high hill naturally defended by precipice was selected, and the side that offered any facilities of ascent was cut into to form a steep sinuous path, guarded by a wall on one side and the vertical fall of the hill on the other. From four to seven powerful gates were thrown across this path at strategic points in the ascent. The curtain walls of forts built on level ground were defended by wide and deep ditches, and if they were situated on the bank of a river, they were defended by the river on that side and by ditches on the other sides, the ditches being crossed at the gates by drawbridges, as at Agra. The walls are normally of great thickness, especially on level ground, where they are from 31 to 35 feet thick. The gateways differ in strength but are often very powerful. They are frequently defended by barbicans, which sometimes take the form of two powerful walls that extend out beyond the gate with towers at the end and a sinuous road between. At some forts, the gateways are trebled with open courtyards between. An unusual defense is the one at the Mandu Gate at Bidar. Here, the approach to the gate is through an ascending tunnel, with a guard room midway in its course. Great care was taken that there should be an abundant supply of water within these extensive fortresses. Wells were dug here and there, and large and deep reservoirs called tanks were excavated in the solid rock to conserve the rainwater falling during the rainy seasons. Systems for conveying water through pipes from lower to higher ground were often installed. 
Supplies of water were also directed to ornamental fountains and cascades in the gardens of the palaces. Silos were also provided for the storage of grain. In addition to the forts, many of the mosques and tombs are surrounded by high walls with fortified gateways. For many centuries, the military conquest of India was from north to south, but while Muslim rule became relatively stable in the north, it was always violently contested in the Deccan and in the south, until eventually, in the 18th century, the wave of conquest proceeded in the opposite direction, when the Marathas extended their conquests as far north as the Indus and the Himalayas. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.